Hi everybody and welcome to this week's LEGO Technic video. Uh, for many weeks now I've been presenting various two-speed gearbox designs uh, that I have been working on and for example some of them have used a, a differential for torque detection others have used a worm gear for torque detection like this one and yet others have combined the torque detector with a gear changing mechanism at the same time. Now a lot of these gearboxes I've demonstrated like uh, just turning them on like this and putting some loading on by hand and demonstrating that with that loading there's a gear change and consequently the gearbox generates more output torque at the output. Now one of my viewers challenged me to put one of these gearboxes into a two-speed automatic car and see if we could drive up a ramp by changing gears as it needed to. So I took up that challenge and ended up building this uh, two-speed automatic car. Uh, this one incorporates that uh, gear changing mechanism I just demonstrated below. And when in that video I presented this car and it hit the ramp, I thought it would go up no problem, but in fact it just completely stopped. Uh, it was a complete failure. It did drive, but as soon as it uh, changed gears, it uh, seemed to actually perform worse than uh, in the first gear that it started off in. So what went wrong with this gearbox design? Well, one thing I didn't appreciate is the amount of power and torque loss within a torque detector, as well as the power and torque loss within different gear switching techniques. So I spent the next many videos that I presented uh, studying uh, torque and power and power curves, I looked at uh, gear switching techniques, I looked and presented different uh, torque detectors, as well as uh, power and torque equations or power distribution. And many of these videos are really worthwhile watching if you want to understand more about torque and power and gearboxes. But all this research has culminated in my latest gearbox design that I've implemented into a two-speed automatic uh, car. And I'll be presenting that to you today. So the key points of difference in this gearbox design is the fact that I use a worm gear for torque detection and disengaging a secondary gear. Uh, so instead of using the regular Lego Technic switch for gear disengagement, quite often this can kind of get stuck with the, with the high torque and it becomes quite hard to disengage. Instead of that I've created this um, worm gear torque detector which is sort of encased in this housing and as it is torque detected this will move and it can engage and disengage this uh, bevel gear on the right here so that can move like that and engage the gear and it can move back like that and disengage it. So the other main design point is the fact that I'm disengaging the gear to switch from the high gear down to the low gear. Uh, by doing that I'm reducing the uh, complexity of the secondary gear path. So just in this diagram it kind of illustrates what I'm doing. So I've got the input, I've got uh, gear ratio A along the top and gear ratio B along the bottom with the differential. The differential adds up A and B to give an overall output speed of O and this is where I'm doing the gear disengagement. So by disengaging path B, uh, the overall uh, path for the uh, lower gear gets simplified and therefore we get an improvement in efficiency in the overall gearbox for that second low gear. And the final key point of this design is that I've got the torque detector on the secondary path to the main power path. So in this particular gearbox for the car, we've got the main power path traveling through these differentials. Coming off that one of those differentials is the torque detector path and that is separate from the main path and what that does it eliminates or reduces the amount of torque losses in the torque detector which I can illustrate in this diagram here so essentially what I've got I've got the main power path A going through the differential we've got the torque detector path on path B and if you do the maths you find the power travels through the path with the highest gearing ratio so if this path is going faster than that one then most of the power will travel through path A and that's exactly what I've done in this design the torque detector is going at low speed and the main power path is going at a high speed which means the overall uh, percentage of the power travelling through path A is given by A over A plus B. So if you've got for example a ratio of 5 to 1 uh, in this gearing then about 85% of the power will travel through path A and a uh, much lower percentage through path B therefore uh, reducing the overall uh, torque losses in the torque detector. Okay, so in terms of the gears in this gearbox, it's got the two different gears. It's got the low gear and the high gear. I'll first talk about the low gearing ratio. That is when the gearbox is more powerful. So the overall gearing ratio, what I've got, I've got a 20 to 1 uh, driving from the uh, motor onto the uh, first main axle. Then I've got a 1 to 3. Uh, that then goes through the torque detector part, which is a 4 to 5. Then at the output, I've got a 1 to 3. Then we've got the, uh, 28, uh, the 20 to 28 driving the um, differential onto the wheels and the wheels as well have got a 20 to 12. So if you calculate the overall gearing ratio of the low gear is 0.063. Uh, now the high gear, uh, like I said, there's the more complex path. So what I'm doing, I'm disengaging 
uh, all this part of the path. Uh, so if you compare these two equations, we've got everything in common. That third except for this part, and that's the part that's being engaged or disengaged by the automatic gearbox. Uh, that part of the gearbox has got this equation for the gearing, I won't go through all the details, but it gives us an overall gearing ratio of 0.11, so the relativity from high gear to low gear, look at that ratio, is 0.11 over 0.063, which is a gearing ratio of 1.71 between high and low gears. Okay, so let's first talk about what's involved in driving a car up a ramp. So of course as a car's driving along the flat, there's a certain amount of power losses in the motor and the gearing system, so you always need a certain amount of torque just to keep that car moving. Now of course if you're in space and there's no friction then once you're moving you'll just keep moving but however uh, with a Lego gearbox there are a lot of power losses and you always need to see amount of torque just to keep moving. Uh, as soon as you hit that ramp uh, of course you need more torque to go up the ramp and the reason for that is you're actually um, of course fighting against gravity and you need to actually move up vertically and that increases your potential energy uh, as measured uh, against the Earth's gravity. So if we look at the mass that's involved in calculating how much power you need to go up the ramp, I've drawn a, a diagram at the back here. So what we've got, we've got our car, uh, we've got our ramp, the car has got uh, a motor in the middle, it's got a gearing ratio of G between the motor axle and the back wheel axle, the wheel has got a radius of W, uh, it's going up a ramp of angle theta, uh, the motor speed is going at speed R, that's revolutions per second, and the car goes to mass M. Now what happens is that uh, if we look at the torque on the motor, let's call that tor, then the power generated by the motor is R, which is the speed of the motor, times the, to uh, the torque, times 2 pi. Now I've demonstrated this equation in some of my previous videos on torque and power, so have a look at those if you want to understand better where this comes from. And then what we can do, we can use that equation and all these other equations to work out the amount of power that's required additional or an extra torque to go up that ramp. So first of all what we can do is we'll work out the wheel speed. So the wheel speed is pretty much the speed at which the, uh, the wheel is rotating. So of course the motor is going at speed R. We've got a gearing ratio of G so that means that the wheel speed, like the speed at which it's rotating, is going to have to be uh, R times G. So that's the speed of the motor times the gearing ratio. Then because the wheels have got a radius of W, you'll get a certain ground speed. So as it's, the wheel's rotating, it's going to force a certain speed relative to the ground. And because the wheel's got radius of W, then the circumference is going to be 2 pi W. So the ground speed is going to be Rg times 2 pi times W, the radius of the wheel. And then once we hit the ramp and we're going at that uh, ground speed, then we're going to end up with a certain vertical speed depending on the angle of the ramp. And that will be given by uh, g 2 pi w times the sine of that angle. So if the uh, angle is flat, then of course you need no energy because you're not going up. If it's very steep, you need a lot more energy. So that's sine theta. Uh, so then we can work out, uh, so that's the vertical speed. Now the potential energy that, that we are increasing by is given by the height times the mass times the gravitational constant. So the vertical power needs to be multiplied by that, uh, those two, those three factors. So we've got uh, g 2 pi w sine theta times m, I'm running out of room here, times g, where g is a gravitational constant. So that's it's about 9.81 uh, meters per second per second. And then we can relate that power equation back to the motor power. So what this is kind of saying is we need to generate this much extra power to go up that ramp, and that has to come from the motor. Now the motor power is given by R uh, torque times 2 pi. So if we equate, equate those two, then we can work out the, the extra torque required. Now we can cancel out the R and the 2 pi, because these two must be equal. Then R and 2 pi cancel out, we end up with G times W times sine theta times the mass times the gravitational constant. So that shows you the amount of extra torque required uh, to be generated by the motor to be able to go up the ramp. And you can see it's proportional to the gearing ratio. So if you increase the gearing ratio, which means the car's going to go faster, you need obviously more torque. Uh, it increases as well as the wheel radius. Uh, it increases with the sine of the angle the mass of the car and well, gravity is pretty much constant on Earth. So that tells us how much extra torque is required to go up the ramp.
Now what's interesting about this equation is the fact that it's actually completely independent of the motor speed R, which is kind of, uh, for me, was a little bit counterintuitive. I thought, well, obviously the faster you go, you're going to be going up the ramp more quickly and needing a lot more torque to be able to do that. But uh, the reason is, is simply because the motor power is also proportional to the speed, so the faster it does go, the more power you're generating, and the two uh, kind of cancel out. Uh, now, of course, this uh, torque calculation is purely the theoretical uh, torque based on energy uh, to counteract gravity. It doesn't take into account the losses in the gearbox due to friction and things like that. Uh, so, in reality, this torque is going to have to be a lot higher. It's, of course, it's very hard to calculate the uh, frictional components uh, within the gearbox uh, simply due to the complexity of that. Uh, so, like I said, this is purely energy calculation in reality the, the required torque would be a lot higher and of course this is the additional torque that's required to to overcome uh, the vertical ramp uh, so that's additional to the horizontal torque for the, just the, the normal driving of the car taking into account all the frictions in the gearbox just from driving horizontally and of course as you do increase the loading uh, you do find that the frictional losses also increase proportionally as well uh, so that's just something that has to be measured rather than calculated at this stage Okay, so how do you measure the torque of a motor anyway? Well, it sounds complex, but it's actually a lot easier than what you might think. Uh, what I've got here is a graph relating the torque of a um, large power function's motor relative to its speed. And what you find is that as the torque is increased, the speed pretty much linearly decreases with that increasing torque. So what that means is rather than trying to measure the torque directly, you can just simply measure the speed, and then use that graph to relate the speed back to the torque in order to make that measurement. Okay, so I'm going to be taking two torque measurements. Um, I'll be doing that by measuring, like I said, the speed of this gear here, and that gear is connected directly onto the uh, motor axle through a 20 to 28 gearing. On there, I've got a reflective surface, which allows me to measure the speed with a laser tachometer. Like I said, I'm going to be taking two measurements, one with the car off the ground. I've added some supports just to keep it off the ground, and then after that, I'll compare that to the torque losses when you're just driving along the flat. Okay, so I'll just take a motor speed measurement, uh, unloaded, so the car is sitting off the ground. Uh, we've got that reflective surface there. I'll just turn on the uh, motor, you can see it's rotating there. Let's take the measurement. So just taking the measurement now. Let's come back at uh, 208.8 RPM. I've got to convert that back through that gearing ratio that I've got there, so about 209, say, uh, times 28 divided by 20, so that gives us a motor revolution speed of 292 rpm so looking at the graph 292 is sitting about there on the graph so it's probably about four and a half newton centimeters of torque and you can see that the total torque range of the motor is about 15 to 20 so it's really using almost a third of the power or the torque just uh, in the unloaded gearbox so i think those, those are quite uh, big power losses but that's just the nature of of gearboxes Okay, so I've taken those supports off, now I'm trying to take a speed measurement with the car driving on the flat instead of sitting up on some supports. Okay, so I'll turn her on and we'll take a measurement again. And that measurement has come back at 150 RPM on that uh, gear wheel there. So 150 again, we have to put that through uh, the calculation for the gearing ratio. So that becomes now a speed of 210 instead of 284. So we've gone from being around at this point down to 210 so all the way across to there so we've almost doubled the uh, the torque uh, on the motor just uh, driving on the flat so we're sitting at this about this point it's actually yeah, quite good it's quite close to the peak power of the motor uh, however of course most of that power is being lost in the in the gearing system okay so just going back to the theoretical calculation for the additional torque requirement for going up the uh, ramp uh, I've now actually inserted some actual values for these parameters so we've got a wheel uh, diameter that I've used here of about uh, 6, uh, 6.2 centimeters so the radius in terms of meters is 0 0.031 uh, we've got our gearing ratio for the high gear uh, 0.11 uh, I'm looking at about a 40 degree ramp so the sign of 40 degrees is about 0.64 the mass of the car is about 700 grams uh, which is 0 0.7 kilogram and the gravitational constant is 9.81 you multiply all those out we get a required torque of uh, just 1.5 newton centimeters and of course this is a surprisingly small number uh, considering the torque measurements for just driving along the flat are much higher than that so i suspect probably in practice you have to multiply that number by about five uh, to get an accurate actual torque requirement given the losses you know according to this graph so like i said before like we've measured 
just driving along uh, you know, the car off the ground with, with no load on the gearbox, really sitting at, around this point in terms of the uh, torque. And then uh, once we're driving along the flat, we're sitting at about uh, 9 or 10 uh, newton centimeters of torque. So, uh, yeah, I'm really suspecting that uh, that theoretical uh, equation uh, needs to be multiplied by about 4, 4 or 5. So, if you multiply that by 4, you put in an extra 6 uh, newton centimeters, and you're getting to the point where the, the motor will stall and fail to get up that ramp. And of course, once we switch gears and change that uh, gearing ratio G down to a lower value of 0.063 for the low gear, and also the increased uh, motor efficiency or gearbox efficiency will hopefully uh, be sufficient to, to not run out of torque and be able to go up the ramp. Okay, the moment we've all been waiting for. On the right, I've set up the ramp. The ramp's sitting at about 45 degrees. Uh, what I've done, I've added a component onto the gearbox to prevent it from switching. So at the moment, it can only just stay in that uh, high gear. Can't switch gears, and we'll just demonstrate what happens. Let's drive. And it hits the ramp, and well, pretty much stops straight away. Uh, very similar to my first attempt of my initial automatic two-speed gearbox that did not work. So now we'll just try it again. We'll take off the gear change prevention component and let's try again. Good luck. Bang, hit the ramp, change gears, up the ramp we go. Look at that. See you later. And then back down again. Wow, what a success! Absolutely fantastic! Show you that again. Change gears. Up the ramp, no problem. Alright, well I think that's a great success. That ends my journey in trying to create a two-speed automatic gearbox that actually works in practice in a two-speed automatic car driving up a ramp. So thanks for watching, I hope you got something out of it. Please like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.